Mr. Armstrong, at 39, with quite a few years of flying time ahead of you, what would you expect to be your last space flight? Well, I have no idea what, uh, what the future is going to uh, hold for each of us, Walter, but I know that uh, the next 10 years and, and uh, the next several decades are going to be even more exciting than, than the past decade. From Houston, Texas, in color, a special one-hour version of Face the Nation, the first exclusive television interview with the Apollo 11 crew who returned on Thursday from the nationwide tour celebrating their historic first steps on the moon. Millions in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles turned out to greet the returning space pioneers. Now back again in Houston awaiting a world tour, the three astronauts, Mission Commander Neil Armstrong, his colleague in the moonwalk, Colonel Edwin E. Aldrin, Jr., and Command Module Pilot Lieutenant Colonel Michael Collins will be questioned by CBS News correspondent David Schumacher, Howard Benedict of the Associated Press, and CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. We shall resume the interview with the astronauts in a moment. Give and say uh, 10 more years of uh, actual flight as an astronaut commander. What do you think then, if you had a flight toward the end of that period, uh, you might be doing? What would, what would you say 10 years? That's, that's 1979. Well, we've always been poor prophets, uh, Walter. We've, we underestimate. I think we overestimate in a year. We say we're going to do something next year, and we haven't accomplished that much. But if you look ahead 10 years, then you find out that our ability to correctly prophesy is always undershooting. Uh, we do much more in 10 years than, than we'd expect. And if we uh, judge that will probably be true, then I think that in 10 years we'll, we'll be looking at the planets. Colonel Aldrin, uh, next month, a task force is going to make recommendations to President Nixon about what our goal should be in space in the next decade. If you were writing those recommendations, what would you suggest? <coughs> what would you like to see done? Howard, I, I think we've uh, laid the foundation for a, a very logical uh, approach toward these goals. We have uh, many opportunities in continued uh, lunar exploration. I think we're uh, just scratching the surface, so to speak, uh, as to what we can obtain from uh, many of the Earth orbital space station studies and uh, applications toward uh, Earth resources. And certainly, I think, uh, economical means of uh, ferrying vehicles through the use of a space shuttle of some sort. Uh, these are the, the type things that uh, we will probably uh, be very interested in exploring. And, of course, the uh, uh, eventual exploration beyond the moon uh, towards some of the planets, I think, is... Uh, something that uh, must be looked into. Gentlemen, a sort of shorthand uh, target, uh, a description of what we should do next uh, seems to be revolving around uh, Mars, the debate over whether or not this is the time to set a Mars goal. Uh, the man you work for, Thomas Paine, the administrator of NASA, says that uh, it looks like 1981 might not be a bad time. On the other hand, another man and men you work for, the uh, House uh, Agri uh, House uh, Aeronautical and Space Committee says that we're not even ready to set such a goal for 10 years or so. Which, who is right? Uh, are we ready to set a Mars goal or not? Oh, well, probably both of those uh, gentlemen have, have had uh, the opportunity to look at more recent analyses than we have, uh, having been tied up 105% uh, of our time on Apollo 11. But I'm, I'm quite certain that uh, goals uh, of the Mars variety are within our range should we, should we choose to uh, decide to, to make that uh, investment of our, our national resources. Uh, I think it's certainly possible uh, since uh, a planetary trip does always involve a, a long duration flight that uh, initial flights to the planets that is particularly circumplanetary, non-landing but exploratory flights, can be combined 
with Earth orbiting spacecraft to develop that long term capability with the very same type of spacecraft. And so that would certainly be a contender in my view. Well, one of the important factors, perhaps, according to Werner von Braun, the most important factor in going to the moon was that a specific date was set, a specific goal was set. Would you today set a specific goal for Mars, and what year would you put on it if you wanted to do that? I would, and I don't think 1981 is too soon. I think it's well within our capability to do so. And as Neil pointed out, uh, the very nature, the long duration of the trip requires a, a careful design and testing of the equipment, which could uh, easily be done in Earth orbit with with uh, a number of, of ancillary benefits in terms of Earth resources, uh, observations, and, and other things which the uh, that the non-Mars people would propose as well. Would you agree with 1981? Okay. I certainly think it's uh, well within our capability to be prepared for that date. I will complete the survey. <laughs> I, I'm not so sure that I would agree that, uh, that this is the time that we can accurately uh, set a date like 1981. I think uh, the setting of a goal is certainly one that we should uh, do, and then as we learn more about this, then I believe that uh, perhaps we can come up with a firm timetable for exactly when we could accomplish this. You're suggesting, Buzz, then we ought to have an intermediate goal of some kind, uh, the manned space station as an intermediate uh, goal on a timeline? I, I would think so. I think we would like to spell out what our complete intentions are and, uh, and to set these goals in an intermediate way. And then as we, as we reach these intermediate goals, then I believe we'll be able to, to better define exactly uh, what our longer term goals are in terms of 10 years from now. I think it's very difficult to make uh, estimates at this time uh, for something as, as difficult and as complex and as uh, time consuming as a uh, Mars trip. You, you open up uh, in, uh, in that uh, answer another question. In going to the moon, when the, when the goal was set in 61 to go to the moon, we really didn't know how we we're going there yet. I mean, that, that the technique of going there hadn't been decided at the time that the goal was set. Uh, do you see clearly the technique for going to the moon, uh, going to Mars, or are we going to have a uh, have to debate the means of getting there? Is it just is it just a matter of funding, and we know how to do it, or do we have to start it from scratch and going to Mars now? Well, we we, uh, we know how to go to Mars. Clearly, uh, our uh, recent unmanned uh, observations of Mars have shown that we know how to go there, and I think uh, we can equally well uh, return. Uh, there are some variations in the method that might be used with specific details as to the booster used and, and so on, but I, I should suspect that that well, would be I pretty well known. Method, uh, well, I just wanted to pursue that. Then, then you mean, is if you use the comparison of the unmanned flyby, uh, then we would go on a single trip from from Earth. You, you wouldn't uh, use a manned space station as an intermediate point in going to Mars. You might very well use an intermediate point. I uh, meant to imply that the, the navigation, the method of, of the traverse, the geometry of the trajectory is, is known. And, uh, what about we the problem of, of uh, living for a long time in space? Do we have to determine whether man really can survive for months on end in space? Based on your experience, uh, you probably are happy to get out after eight days. Well, I uh, should say, Howard, that uh, I certainly uh, enjoyed the entire trip, and uh, I had uh, no, uh, no hesitation at all about uh, living in that uh, environment for a considerably longer period of time. Now, uh, the question that you raise about the duration of the mission is is one that our forthcoming flights, uh, Apollo application series, will start to answer. And certainly, uh, the next step beyond that is going to require longer duration uh, experiments, probably first in Earth orbit, to determine if there are any limiting criteria that we're, uh, that, that will stop uh, what, what we're think might be possible. Of course, it was easy for you, Neil. You and Buzz got out and walked around, got a lot of exercise. Mike sat there for the whole time in, the, in Columbia, the command module. Let him answer that. Were you comfortable for eight days? Well, as a, as a lazy man, I can say I was very comfortable. <laughs> and, uh, 
Further, I, I, I feel that you're quite right, Howard. Uh, the <clears throat> medical implications uh, must uh, clearly be understood before we commit to setting sail to Mars. But fortunately, the, uh, the Earth orbital environment is the same as, as it would be on the trip to Mars and coming back. And uh, I think that's a, a question that is easily answered. I think the, the medical aspects of it are, are perhaps of, uh, of less concern than some of the uh, the engineering uh, difficulties and designing equipment whose reliability is sufficiently high to uh, to guarantee that you're, you're willing to uh, take the extremely long duration that's necessary for the entire trip. Well, we are going to have to take a much larger spacecraft to Mars. You're, you're, certainly your creature comforts are going to have to be a great deal uh, better than they are in, uh, in the Apollo command module, as fine as it is. Well, Sanitation, just for one thing. I would expect so. I would uh, expect that the design of these vehicles would uh, place much more emphasis upon the off-duty hours than do the uh, uh, and did the Gemini or the Apollo, which pays virtually no attention to that. You're 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 really on duty 24 hours a day in our present vehicles. Let me ask you a very practical question, uh, if somewhat veiled. Would you want to be gone from your wives and families for a year or two on a Mars trip? Would you, Neil Armstrong, want to take a trip of that length? Well, I'd like to take a trip that, of that length, and uh, perhaps Walter's suggestion of a considerably larger vehicle would uh, allow us to take the families along. <laughs> but those would have to be the conditions for you personally? Oh, no, I think not. And uh, certainly uh, uh, there's a lot of historical precedent. The old uh, sailing ships certainly went out for long periods. Even our present maritime vehicles, uh, fishermen from various parts of the world and, uh, and, uh, and many of our seagoing colleagues uh, spend extended periods at sea without their families, and I think that's perfectly practical to extend that kind of motivation into, into our efforts. We've been sitting here just Madison assuming... Madison Avenue commuters in New York who don't get home for two <laughs> years. <laughs> <at a time. laughs> We've just been assuming that uh, it's logical to go to Mars, and yet the unmanned probes show that it's really not that much different, apparently, than the moon. Why even bother with everything else there is to do, particularly here on Earth? Well, we, have, we do have and will continue to have uh, an unquenchable curiosity to understand our solar system. And I'm uh, quite sure that now that we believe that's within our means to look, we will. And it's just a matter of time now. It's when will you do it, not whether you will do it. Now, assuming that uh, it will be done and uh, it will be done at some point, then it's just a question of of uh, what is the order and so on. And, and I think it's, 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 it's important to say that a spacecraft that uh, is able to, to fly to Mars, that's able to trans transfer itself around between planets, that same spacecraft can probably go to uh, nearly any of the nearby planets, the same configuration, the same type of spacecraft. So such an exploring vehicle would not be limited just to what we know about Mars. It'd be more a, a, a truth searching vehicle that uh, could go uh, go to many of the planets and and uh, find out things of, of, of substance. You say we have an unquenchable desire to know, but yet, uh, according to the most recent survey, still just barely more than 50 percent of the people think that space is one of those major areas in which the budget can be cut. Is that uh, discouraging to you after? Let's, David, let's get into that in uh, just a moment, right. if we might. We'll be back in just a moment. NASA has scheduled nine more moon landing flights over the next three years, and they aren't too much different from what yours are because we're, we're limited to what time we can spend on the moon and so on. Uh, and I'm often asked, why spend $400 million a shot just to go up and do some scientific research, bring back some rocks? Uh, how can we justify these other nine flights for the public? And do you think perhaps maybe after four or five, we will learn enough that we could cut them off and maybe aim for building a moon base, something like that? Well, it uh, doesn't seem logical to me that, that a businessman would build a, a factory and then turn out his first prototype product and say, now I'm going to close down the plant. And you look at, from an overall view, that, that doesn't seem to be a very profitable uh, approach to, to uh, good business. Similarly, I, I don't think it would be a good approach for us to build up this uh, 
this capability of, of flying to the moon and uh, be satisfied with only uh, the first small product. I think since the, the overwhelming majority of the expenditure has already been made in terms of the, the developments of the plants and the people and the, the boosters, the, they're, they're built, the spacecraft are built, they're ready to fly. The, the amount of money required to continue the, the completion of, of the of the program is very small. Well, could, couldn't the hardware be used, uh, say, if you took the last four moon landing flights off, couldn't the hardware be used for building a base on the moon and, and get an early start on it? Well, I haven't had the opportunity to, to investigate closely that kind of a proposal, but I'm certainly uh, uh, sure that we will always reevaluate uh, each individual flight as as uh, you know, we've, we've made a large number of changes in the past in our schedules and the objectives for each uh, schedule based on the fact that we're always a, a little bit uh, smarter this week than we were last week. And uh, there's certain times when, uh, when it's appropriate to change your mind and change your goals slightly. And uh, I, I would suspect that certain of those changes we will see uh, during the forthcoming uh, completion of the, the, the nine flights that, that you mentioned. However, in general, I would think the overall objective, that of, of doing a, essentially a, a survey of, uh, of the most important scientific areas of the moon is appropriate. At what point do the flights to the moon uh, pass the division point between being primarily engineering and go over to primarily scientific. I mean, obviously the first flight is, is an engineering flight. You've got to yeah. prove that you can get there and, and, and do the job. And there must be more refinement of that. How far can you move beyond uh, the base and how long can you stay and things of that kind. At what point does it pass that division between engineering and science? I think it would be a gradual transition and I would uh, fully expect uh, many of these transitions into uh, more scientific uh, investigations to be uh, coming up on the Apollo 12 flight. I think that uh, we'll have the time between each, each mission to, to find out just uh, what new things can be done on the surface, and we'll be looking ahead one, two, or three missions and uh, trying to capitalize as much as we possibly can on what's been learned from the previous flights. There's been a certain amount of controversy developed in uh, recent weeks, although it's been continuing for longer than that, I'm sure, behind the scenes, over this matter of science versus engineering in the flights. Uh, the crews have now been assigned for Apollo 12, 13, and 14. Uh, on 13 and 14, uh, the rookie astronauts there are even less uh, senior. They are junior to some of the scientist astronauts. That plus uh, the resignation of uh, Wilmot Hess, the chief uh, scientist, has uh, prompted a, a former astronaut, scientist astronaut, Brian O'Leary, to say that the gap between science and engineering is widening, and scientists are coming out on the short end. Is that true, or what is your reaction to that? Well, I, I think that probably uh, we have not done as, as much pure science as, as many people would have liked on our initial flights. We think that's justifiable based on the fact that first you must, in fact, demonstrate that it's possible in every practical uh, bit of your energy should be, should be directed toward uh, first having a safe, safe successful flight. Uh, I think that we will continue to incorporate more and more science into these flights. The, the, uh, the plans uh, seem to indicate that, and uh, based on our experience on the lunar surface, we think it's uh, now a good bit more practical to uh, to perform some of the, the things uh, uh, that, then, that w were previously questioned. If you remember, just immediately prior uh, to uh, the flight of Apollo 11, uh, there was a certain group of the scientific committee, or scientific community that was very critical of our, our putting uh, men on the moon uh, with the contention that we would be completely unable to be perform in that uh, in that environment, and uh, that we were in fact uh, endangering our, our own safety uh, by, by the attempt. 
Well, as you know, we fortunately found that that was not a, a fact. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, just the opposite is true. We were able to work readily and, and to, in fact, enjoy ourselves while we were doing it. Consequently, uh, we're encouraged to believe that an increasing amount of science can be performed on the lunar surface. That was certainly one of the most enjoyable parts of, uh, of Apollo 11. And I'm sure that those, uh, those crew members after, uh, after us, 12 and 13, will, will have uh, even higher uh, degree of, of success in, in, in terms of the scientific objectives of the flight. Do you, do you think they can uh, really move out now on the basis of what you have learned in Apollo 11? Uh, what are you able to tell them about how far away from the base they can get and how long they can stay out? Of course, they're limited by the portable life support system and how long they can stay out. But uh, uh, how many trips could they make out? How long could they work out there and so forth? What are your recommendations on that? Well, I we have told the uh, Apollo 12 crew that uh, we think it's reasonable to go a good bit farther than, uh, than we ventured, and perhaps a half mile or a mile. The limitation here is one of being able to return to the lunar module should you have a failure in the backpack. And that uh, will be true whether, uh, whether we're walking or flying around the moon or going around on jeeps. Uh, that, same limitation will probably be true, and uh, we we suspect, though, that uh, with improvements in the backpacks and our emergency oxygen and, and so on, in uh, in say a very few number of flights, why we'll be able to do substantially more than we would guess now. We'll be back in just a moment. Howard, did you have a question? I think, uh, Walter, we ought to explore some of the momentous flight that we've just gone through. I would like to talk especially about the descent stage. You had some pretty hair-raising moments on those final uh, final 50,000 feet, uh, especially the final few thousand. You had computer alarms flashing. You had uh, to take manual control to avoid a crater. You were running low on fuel. The dust was kicking up and obscuring your visibility. And uh, Dr. Payne has said that if it hadn't been for the ground, you might have had to abort the, uh, the landing. Uh, could you give us your feelings on that? If you had no input from the ground, would you have had to abort, or could you have gone in and landed? I should think we would, would have tried to continue. Now, uh, our basic approach is to, to keep continuing until uh, you uh, see that it's either going to be impossible to complete the landing or until you're running into a, uh, a dangerous situation. In uh, this case, uh, we, we may have uh, been able to continue, and we certainly would have tried until one of those boundaries was reached. Uh, you do so with considerably less confidence than, than you would, however, with everything operating as you'd hoped. Well, now, there are mission rules, but did you and Buzz have your own personal go-no-go -no -go point when, when were you going to get out of there? Well, we would, uh, we would not leave until uh, we either had inadequate fuel to complete the landing or that the trajectory itself was unsatisfactory, that is, uh, the descent rate or the altitude, uh, the combination of, of velocity and altitude and so on would, would have precluded a successful landing. There's an awful lot of pressure on you in this situation. Here's the full 10 years and the full 24 billion or whatever it is uh, at stake. Is, is there a, almost a feeling that this is a do or die situation for you two? Did you consider that at all or think that way? I don't believe so. We're, we're very much interested in the, uh, the items of the moment and solving those particular problems as they come up. Now, now we did have some uh, communications difficulty, uh, which occupied a good bit of our time early in the descent. The uh, program alarms that occurred uh, later on as we were passing the five, six minute point. Uh, the major effect of these was to deny us displays that were available to us on the keyboard. Uh, at the same time, we did have displays going to various instruments uh, 
on the instrument panel, which were giving us essentially the same information. So uh, this momentary uh, overcrowding of the computer uh, was one of a, a bothersome nature, which uh, forced us to investigate, to find the source of the uh, difficulty, and then to proceed past it. Here oh, you guys go again. It's just another flight. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, now just a minute here. Yeah, let's get into this a little more. You say it's forced you to investigate. You're, you're on a split-second situation here we've seen the film I mean we, we we have had been able to share this with you in a sense uh, you know you're coming down pretty <laughs> doggone fast it's faster than uh, uh, you know a, a, a announcer can kind of keep up with it even 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 yourselves and in, in telling about it you know and you can't tell everything that happened here's a split-second decision I, uh, I don't understand it you, you've got a computer here that is out now is that it? I mean, it's not functioning. No, no well, the computer was continuing to give us information, and then a light comes on and says, program alarm. Well, since we don't know the source of this alarm, and it could be a serious one, it requires that we interrogate the computer through uh, various keys to find no, out wait, what no, this is. Wait, just th right there a minute, Buzz. You're coming down woof, toward the moon, and you're going to interrogate the computer. Hey, please, Mr. Commuter, uh, computer, uh, you know, what, what are you doing there, Mr. Computer? Now, now this interrogate the computer? Walter, well, this is something that's done of, of normal uh, course. Uh, during a normal descent, uh, as soon as the radar would lock on, and this would be indicated by the change of status lights, we would then interrogate the computer to find out the difference between the altitude reading that the computer had and that information that was being uh, fed into it by the radar. And this was not being incorporated in to, Im to improve our knowledge of where we are until we tell it to, to uh, start making use of this radar information. Now, in doing this, we have to interrogate the computer with a verb, a noun, this and is punching, so forth, things punching into the keyboard. We're continuing, All continuing right, continuously doing this. you know you're going to be long, and, you're, and Neil, you're looking out the window, and all of a sudden, you're already long, and there is a boulder field uh, in the middle of a crater that you've got to add more fuel to, and you're already a little concerned about fuel. Didn't you even look over at Buzz and say, wow, or, or anything? I mean, like this is going to be a hairy one. No, we, uh, we did just what we had been practicing to do in, in the months and months prior to the flight. I did all the uh, looking out the window to, uh, to judge uh, whether or not this would be a satisfactory area. Buzz concentrated all his information inside the cockpit to uh, not just the operation of the computer, but also uh, doing his own jobs of display monitoring plus the ones that I normally do and uh, feeding me uh, information from inside and uh, worked uh, like a charm and we can't give enough credit to the people on the ground who were able to uh, add a little confidence to the situation by their uh, timely judgments as to the the actual uh, illness of the computer if any and essentially they were telling us the computer really isn't ill it's just got some symptoms well, were you frightened at all and did you think aboard at any time no, no, I think uh, we were a good ways away from a condition that would require an abort. When, when these program alarms were coming up, uh, at least in the, the latter ones around uh, 3,000, 2,000 feet, we had uh, very, we were quite capable to be able to take over completely, either on the primary guidance system and land manually or making use of the abort guidance system and a manual throttle. What about before the flight? Uh, now, today, you're heroes and you're getting ticker tape parades wherever you go. But before the flight, did you ever lose any sleep thinking you might wind up a goat after all this? I, I think we uh, like to look at the positive side <laughs> of things. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> did that, yeah. was, what was the pressure before the flight? The thought that you could blow it off. Well, we were, uh, of course, concerned primarily for the success of the flight and uh, we did not want to come back without having landed that's, that's certainly true we, 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 that. <laughs> uh, but we were certainly willing to do that and uh, that would certainly be uh, much better than than, uh, than not coming back at all so we were resigned to the fact that if uh, it was impossible to land we just wouldn't land Come back. Now that we have you on the surface of the moon, if we could consider the, uh, some of the problems there, um, you were not able to take your uh, documented sample. 
in retrospect, do you think it was a mistake to have all of the sort of formal program at the beginning, the flag planning, the presidential exchange of greetings and how do you do's, uh, and have spent a little more time collecting rocks? Well, I suspect the, uh, the formal, the, the few minutes we spent in the formal ceremonies there was, uh, was far less degrading to our overall service activity than, uh, than our and our awe of the situation and our interest in looking around at the moon and spending more time in, in, uh, in rocks and craters that we were genuinely interested in. Uh, and uh, we were uh, certainly guilty of uh, enjoying that first half hour. <laughs> Neil, uh, about that awe, uh, let me suggest a couple of possibilities here, see if you confirm it for us. Was your excitement level kind of high and did you uh, well, I'm, sh I'm sure your excitement level was high, but was it so high that, that you forgot the words that you had uh, decided you were going to say and, and not put the uh in there and the first step for a man or first step for man? Uh, and second of all, uh, in the, as I understood the flight plan, you were supposed to get down there and the first thing was a contingency sample in rock. Mm -hmm. Apparently you were in awe and were looking at your vehicle uh, and uh, Buzz, I think, or the ground, I wasn't sure where the words came from, reminded you of the contingency sample, and you said you were getting to it. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to get there in a minute. I'm just wondering if, if maybe there was kind of a momentary excitement level that uh, led to these two things. Well, with regard to the first, I can't uh, confirm the words. Uh, I knew what uh, my intentions were, and I thought I said those words. I, uh, I can't uh, prove that. With respect to the contingency sample, that was a definite uh, change in plan that was decided at the time. Due to the yaw angle and shadow location of the spacecraft, it uh, looked like it would be more profitable to, to reverse the order of the camera, uh, the camera descent to the surface in the contingency sample because I wanted to get the contingency sample in an area that had not been washed with the uh, exhaust and contaminated with the exhaust of the engine. Also, I wanted to get it in an area of sunlight where I could see what the sample was. And that was a fairly far away from where I was at the location. It looked to be more expedient to get the camera while I was in the shadow and then take the contingency sample in sunlight. For those who might have uh, missed the earlier chapters of this story, the contingency sample was the very first sample of rock, uh, totally unexamined, that you were going to take with that long scoop and put in your overall pocket there. Speaking of gathering rocks, uh, do you believe that the geology training you had before you went up was adequate for the job you had to do? And what have the geologists and scientists said about the material that you brought back? Was it, were they happy with it? I certainly feel that the uh, geology training that we had was, was adequate for our mission. I think we want to expand this. Uh, in specific areas for uh, future missions, depending on what their uh, particular investigation uh, is going to be. I want to go back, Walter, to the, uh, to the statement that you made when you set foot on the moon. I was entirely satisfied with it, Neil, and it made sense to me just the way it, <laughs> it sounded. Um, did somebody convince you to, that you had made an error in grammar? No. Or had no, you actually intended to say a step for a man? Someone asked me what I said, and I told them what I said, and uh, they said, well, that isn't the way the transcription came out. And that if, was the might <coughs> If you'll recall, I made reference to what Neil had said on one of the television shows on the way back, and my recollection was, it was that's a small step for a man. Speaking of things now that people say, uh, what is your reaction to this? Uh, it's either threatened or actually filed a court suit now by Madeline Murray O'Hare to uh, prevent astronauts from uh, propagandizing God, I guess, in uh, their tran uh, transmissions from space. Well, I think we ought to say a little prayer, uh, and maybe she will see the light. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gotten a little more uh, serious than that in a way. She brought up, as you know, Neil, in that, uh, di an article in Die Sturm, uh, the German magazine, saying that you're an atheist. I don't really know what that has to do with your ability as a test pilot and an astronaut, uh, but uh, since the matter is up, would you like to answer that well, statement? I don't know where uh, 
Mrs. O'Hare gets her information. She said, certainly didn't bother to inquire of me, uh, nor uh, apparently the, the agency. Uh, and I'm certainly not an atheist. Well, apparently, uh, your application simply says no religious preference or something like that on your personnel file. That the agency that's says that. uh, that's uh, agency uh, nomenclature, which which means that you don't have a acknowledged identification with a, or or association with a particular church group at the time. I did not. That that takes care of that question. Uh, I think, uh, hope for the satisfaction of Disturm Magazine and Madeline Murray O'Hare. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Mike, I was wondering when we were talking about uh, aborting on the landing on the moon, about that moment when docking took place. I thought at the news conference here in Houston, earlier last week, it kind of glossed over this episode maybe a little bit of the problem in docking. I was thinking of it more from a human standpoint, your own standpoint. Here you were, uh, you're the guardian angel over this whole operation, and that docking has got to come, right? and you've been sitting there really kind of up for the game. You're going to go in and kick that field goal, uh, you know, in that last minute. And here in that last minute, uh, suddenly, you know, your, your foot was seemed to slip. Uh, no, not, not quite that important. I mean, I mean did you feel uh, that uh, way at all? I think uh, more the feeling of you finally grabbed uh, a hold of this errant child, and now he's uh, kicking and struggling a little bit, and you know you still have him, but uh, you haven't quite gotten him into the bathtub yet. It's more of that feeling. It was a minor thing, uh, a surprise, but... Uh, a, a matter really of, of very little importance. There just was a small gyration or, or oscillation which developed between the two vehicles, which was a surprise, uh, due, uh, I think, primarily to the fact that for the first time we had uh, an extremely light limb and the, uh, the dynamics of the two vehicles were somewhat different than we would have expected. But as I say, it was not a, a, a major problem in any sense. Well, you, you said at the, uh, at the news conference also that uh, when, you, when rendezvous took place, you thought uh, for the first time might really pull this thing off. <laughs> Did you have a feeling at that moment of docking that, oh my gosh, maybe we won't pull this thing off? No, not that much. I thought perhaps I would, at, at worst, I would have to release the lamb and go back and initiate the, uh, the docking process over again. And wasn't that concern that damage had been done in that uh, oscillation uh, in the docking that, that thought flashed through my mind, but uh, it wasn't really that bad. Uh, the, the vehicles are... Uh, are uh, flexibly bound together, but uh, even, even though they bend, there's very little chance to, uh, to actually incur any structural damage which would, which would uh, prevent a successful docking. And glad to see that. Of course, we always have in our hip pocket the, uh, the method of, of bringing Neil and Buzz around through an extravehicular transfer and in through the uh, side hatch. It's a cumbersome procedure, and it would have been rather difficult with the rock boxes, but uh, as I say, we, we always like to keep something in our hip pocket in, in the event of trouble. Mike, so, I'd like to ask one just small personal question. Are you going to get tired of hearing them talk about walking on the moon before these, this series <laughs> of tours is over? Not at all. I'm enjoying it very much. I, uh, as you know, I was over on the back side of the moon for uh, half uh, their walk, and uh, I kept coming around the front side, uh, you know, with the, what they say, what are they doing attitude, and I'm, uh, I'm very happy to, to have them fill me in on those details now. Seems to me another problem you had or it may be a major problem for the Apollo program, is the overshoot. When you, came, when you were coming in for the descent, you were several miles beyond your target. Same thing happened to Apollo 10 on its approach to the moon. Is this problem understood, uh, especially for future flights where you'll have to make pinpoint landings in craters and places like that? Do you, do you understand it now? Well, I think that we knew uh, before the flight that we would have certain difficulty uh, in hitting precisely the center of the footprint area that we were shooting for. It's uh, a difficult procedure to, uh, to control the trajectory of the spacecraft very accurately and start the descent at the proper point over the lunar surface. But with every flight, we're improving our, our knowledge and, and understanding of that. And I think that, uh, that we can expect good luck uh, on, on a, hitting a particular spot on the, on the, loon, on the moon uh, in the future landings. How are you going to increase the duration of your stay, or particularly your activity on the lunar surface, if you're not able to sleep in the lamp? 
I, I think we will be able to sleep in the in the lamb. Uh, we were not able to do that very well because of uh, a number of factors that that we could not that we did not spend adequate time on before flight. Uh, the temperature control of the lamb uh, while it was sitting on the moon, uh, that is the temperature in the cabin, the noise uh, in the cabin, and uh, the lighting in the cabin. All those are things that we can fix now that we uh, understand that uh, they're very likely to keep you from sleeping, and I expect that that, uh, that we'll be able to, to solve that problem. Can they be fixed for 12 that early? I would think that uh, an appreciable percentage of them will be fixed for 12. I think the lighting level will be very easy to uh, fix, to make the shade more uh, opaque, uh, so it'll let less light in. They are working on a restraint system, a hammock sort of uh, arrangement that will enable both crew members to be very, a good bit more comfortable, perhaps, than we were. With one-sixth gravity, do you need a restraint system? Or, do you, uh, or does that one-sixth of your weight uh, uh, keep you pretty stable? Well, I, I found uh, just lying along on the floor was uh, was quite comfortable. Now, there there is really only one flat location, or nearly flat location, in the lamb. Now, uh, in order to be able to stretch out, my, uh, some other provision must be made to support your legs or your head. And something but, like a hammock uh, looks promising. When you talk about restraints, so what you really mean is just something to lie on, a hammock. Yes. Uh, it's not a restraint against uh, weightlessness. Would you expect in future missions that it will be necessary to quarantine the crews on return? Or have we seen the last of that? I uh, think the protocol calls for a quarantine similar to ours for several additional flights until uh, sufficient evidence, statistical evidence, from, from a variety of uh, lunar surface locations uh, proves, proves the point to the to the uh, satisfaction of those people in the government that bear the responsibility for the safety of, of our uh, public. Well, now, there seems to be a, you know, everybody says this is necessary, and they go, ha, ha, ha. Uh, is it really ha, ha, ha? What do you think? Well, we have no way of, uh, no way of, of laughing, I don't think. Uh, the chances are of our bringing anything back are extremely remote, but nonetheless, the, uh, the number is not zero, it approaches zero, but it's not zero, and until you can adequately determine that it was zero, I think you have to take these precautions, and uh, we certainly didn't uh, ha-ha-ha anywhere along the line. Don't you think uh, the quarantine might be broken just by the fact that you opened the hatch out in the Pacific, and if there were any bugs, they could have gotten out of that period? The, uh, the pre-flight planning for that particular uh, event more or less precludes that as a possibility since that uh, air uh, within the, the, the command module cockpit is uh, recirculated so many times through filter systems on all the way back from from the moon to the earth and the the uh, statistical probability of uh, of a lunar pathogen a bug getting outside into those conditions is so remote as to be uh, probably not worthy of consideration. In addition, we did a good bit of cleaning of spacecraft in a vacuum cleaner fashion, and all the nooks, crannies, and crevices to uh, uh, even improve that. There are always a certain number of housekeeping questions we have to ask astronauts when they return from flights. For instance, do all of you, and I'd like an answer from each of you, do you expect to fly again? Do you expect to continue to be active astronauts? I expect to be to continue in the uh, in the program, just whether I'll remain on flight status or not, I, I haven't uh, had the opportunity to make that decision yet, and we have not been uh, been, uh, been rushed into making up our mind as what we'd like to do. I'm available to serve in any capacity that uh, they feel I can contribute best to. to well, would you think now that you're too valuable as, let's say, a public relations tool to let you fly again? Well, I would certainly hope that. Uh, that uh, my technical abilities are, are the things that I will use most. Do you fly again, Mike? Well, Apollo 11 was my last flight, but uh, not uh, not for any reasons that uh, you know I feel that I'm too valuable or anything at all. It's just that uh, I think it's difficult to keep uh, to keep up year after year to uh, to to really approach uh, the training, the uh, 
the living in the simulators and to approach the training with the, uh, with the zeal uh, that you have to in order to do a good job. And, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, encroachments on uh, my family life, which I have not enjoyed. And in view of all those things, I intend to uh, uh, contribute whatever I can to the space program in, in some other capacity. I don't know what that'll be, but right now it, uh, it's going to consist of going on vacation. <laughs> or will you stay in NASA? Well, I'd like to very much. Mike, you said at one time before the flight that you'd take whatever uh, measures were necessary to assure some privacy in your life in the future. How extreme do you think the measures are going to have to be, and what do you have in mind? Yeah, I don't know, Walter. That's a, that's a good question, and one I'm poorly equipped to answer, but uh, I tried uh, growing a mustache. That wasn't the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who ordered the mustache off your wife, I hear? That's the current rumor, Walter. I think you ought to ask her about that. <laughs> well, it's too bad it was lost, because uh, we did have a first there, the first mustache grown as man orbited the moon. And it would have been nice if uh, uh, I, th I think we could have preserved it. You could have stood there at the Smithsonian and shown people the mustache. <laughs> well, we, we all feel uh, honored that uh, we've had the privilege of having you with us today and answering these questions, the crew of Historic Apollo 11. Thank you very much for being with us on Face the Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Today on Face the Nation, the crew of Apollo 11, Mission Commander Neil Armstrong, Colonel Edwin E. Aldrin, Jr., and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Collins were interviewed by CBS News correspondent David Schumacher, Howard Benedict of the Associated Press, and CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Next week, another prominent figure in the news will face the nation. Face the Nation originated today in color from Houston, Texas, through the facilities of KHOU-TV.